Good morning. It is Saturday, February 17th, 2024. I really don't know where the Lord is going to lead this. Um, there's so much he's releasing that um, I just have to trust him. You know, we cannot bring forth anything good. <laughs> we can't. If we bring forth anything good, it's because of him, from the Father of lights. By his own will begat he us by the word of truth. You know, when Jesus, the man came to Jesus and he said, good master. And Jesus said, there is none good but God. He's showing us the way of true humility in these bodies of ours, recognizing that anything that is good is of because of he who is in us. If we can keep that perspective and not enter into performance and thinking that we're doing it of our own work, it's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So I say that to say that <laughs> whatever I bring forth here, I don't even know what he wants to do here because there's so much he's been speaking and I'm just going to trust him and if it's good it's from him so I don't even know what I'm going to title this because I'm not sure what direction he's going to go so I'm just going to begin in Psalm 19 that's where he had me here for a moment before I started this so I'm going to begin there and just flow from there Psalm 19 a Psalm of David says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech. Night unto night showeth forth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their lines goeth throughout all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the ends of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. Nothing is hid from the heat thereof. When it says there, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, that word chamber in the Hebrew is huppah transliterate into our English C-H-U-P-P-A-H -P -P Hoopa it is the marriage canopy when Jesus said I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may also be he was speaking of going to prepare the hoopah in the father's house In Hebrew understanding, Hebrew, the way of life, they would, if a man espoused a bride, he would go to the father's house and prepare a place for her. He would prepare the wedding bed, the canopy, the chuppah. And we see this in Hebrew and in, in Jews' weddings that in um, where they perform their wedding vows, they call it a chuppah. It's the place of consummation. And so the chuppah is where the bride and the bridegroom consummate the divine union. that we truly become one with him. So this is what Psalm 19 is pointing to, which is it's a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, hoopah, the wedding canopy, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. There's two ways we could look at this. He just prepared the, the hoopah, the wedding canopy, 
and now he's going to get the bride. He's going to get the five wise virgins. He's going to get those that have, have prepared themselves, who are without spot or wrinkle. Or he just came out of the wedding hoopa having consummated with the bride. I'm going to take the latter perspective here for now, which is the bridegroom coming out of his chamber rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the ends of heaven and a circuit unto the ends of it. Coming forth with his bride, manifesting this glory. This going forth is from the ends of heaven and a circuit unto the ends of it. Nothing is hid from the heat thereof, of this love. But it's the heat of the sun. Remember, it's as the sun, if we back up, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Now I want to take you to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we see a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, having a crown of 12 stars with the moon under her feet and says she is birthing a man-child. That word man-child is huias. It's a mature son. In the Hebrew thought, that maturity is at the age of 30. A mature son. As Jesus, when the father said unto him, this is my beloved son in whom I have well peace. He was 30 years old. Entering into the inheritance of the father, into the father's house, into the father's business. A mature son. This is what's being birthed out of the woman. Because the sun is shining on her. Consummating with the bride. And birthing the man-child. The man-child who is to rule all nations, is birthed out of the intimacy of the divine union with the bridegroom and the bride. Holy Spirit, I thank you for teaching us. leading us into all truth. Father, I thank you for awakening our hearts, awakening our hearts to the hour, to the shortness of the hour, that we may be prepared. That is, Jesus said, when you begin to see these things happen, which they are beginning to happen. Distress of nations, seas roaring, men's heart failing them for things come. When you begin to see these things happen, look up and lift up your heads. Set your affection on me alone, bride. You who are spouse to me, that you may be without spot, without wrinkle. When you begin to see these things happen, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. The redemption of your body when we are consummated together in divine union. And you become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust.
And so, Holy Spirit, I just thank you for leading us, whatever you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll start there. <laughs> you know, we see these different pictures, right? He calls us to be a bride. He calls us to be a mature son. And people can get confused. What I'm, what, what you know, which, what's what? <laughs> what's, what's going on? Am I a son? Am I a daughter? Am I a bride? But the one who's a spouse to him, it's that intimacy, right? That affection for him alone. Desire for him alone. This is what we're to have in intimacy with him. That we will not lay with this world. We will not give ourselves to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life that would draw us away from the bridegroom. That would soil our garments. That would wrinkle them because we're laying with the spirit of this world. To partake of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, is to lay with the spirit of this world. As the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 5, I think it's verse 19, he says, the whole world lieth. Not, it's not lie like a falsehood. It's laying with. The whole world lieth together in wickedness. What does that mean? They're laying with the spirit of this world in this adultery, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. They're joining themselves to the spirit of this world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, the spirit of the world. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, some people say it's okay to watch this, watch that. I'm like, no. What little amount of the spirit of the world is okay? Tell me. Do you desire to have your garment spotless and white and unwrinkled? Then we cannot, we cannot partake of the spirit of this world. Lust the eyes, lust the flesh, pride of life. Oh, it's okay to watch the Super Bowl. Um, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride, pride, pride of life. But Doug, they pray before the game. <laughs> they point their finger to heaven when they score a touchdown. Look at my team. They're amazing. I'm like... No, my affection's on one. I don't want my desire drawn away from him to anything else. I don't want any open doors. Oh, it's okay to watch that show. Yeah, when do you usually do that? When you're when you're vegging, when you're like tired and now you've opened this door for the spirit of this world to release whatever he wants into you. Lies, deception. Oh, I'm so discerning. I can discern all that. Yeah, I'm thinking they probably thought that in the garden too. And they were deceived. And that throne of glory which was in them. The Lord Most High lifted up within their heart. Lucifer usurped that throne. Because they turned away and they heeded another word. Their affections were turned. 
and Lucifer usurped that throne. And as Romans 1.20 or 21, one, one of those two says, and that when they knew God, it's speaking about in the garden. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, worthless vanity. They became vain in their imaginations professing to be wise, it is able to make you wise. That's constantly Lucifer's draw. All come into these mysteries. It's able to make you wise. That when they knew God, they glorified not as God, as neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations. I hear so many people, their foundation is not the scripture. It's people's visions. It's prophecies. It's apocryphal books that are not divinely inspired. Vain imaginations. That when they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The lights went out. Holy Spirit was no longer captured their heart. They were captured by another light, a dark light. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of God into an image made like corruptible man. That's devastating. Changed the glory of God. See, they bore the glory of God. The king of glory was enthroned in them and they manifested that glory. They were crowned with glory and honor. He who was high and lifted up was high and lifted up within their heart. And they manifested this glory. And they had dominion over all of creation. Ruling and reigning with him in love. And another usurped that place. And in their pride, they were lifted up in their soul and joined with him. And now what they manifested was the carnal mind, corruptible man. Walking in our pride, our own work. led by a counterfeit Holy Spirit, the spirit of this world. I want to go back to Daniel. I don't remember where I was there, but I'm going to go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. It says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. The Lord speaking to Daniel. I think this was the angel Gabriel that came to Daniel to, to reveal this, right? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Seventy weeks of years. Seventy sevens, 490 years. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. To finish the transgression 
and to make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the prophecy and vision. Not to seal up all prophecy, all vision, but that vision that Daniel saw, that prophecy that David saw of the beast system, of the antichrist system coming to its fullness and having this power in the earth, this dominion in the earth for three and a half years, for a time's time and half a time, for 42 months. But Daniel saw that kingdom come to an end. This is what's contained all within the 70 weeks of years, 409 years. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Thy people, Daniel, your people, the Jews. And upon the holy city. To finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the prophecy and the vision, and to anoint the most holy. This is pointing to the anointing of Yeshua HaMashiach, the anointing of Jesus, when he was anointed when the Holy Spirit descended upon him and the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased at the baptism of John. That's when he was anointed to anoint the most holy. So this is, all this is pointing to that, to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, the Lord's commandment, that he, how he was going to bring his people out of Babylon. Out of actually the Medo-Persian Empire. Bring them out and rebuild the city. Rebuild the temple. Restore his people. Know ye there and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Unto Messiah the Prince. Know ye therefore from the commandment from the going forth to to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. It's speaking of being a king and a priest. There's only two that were anointed, only two offices that were anointed. That is that of the king and the priest. And Jesus was both Melchizedek, of the order of Melchizedek, both a king and a priest. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Why is he breaking it up in two different periods? Seven weeks and years is 49 years, and three score and two weeks is 62 weeks and years, 434 years for a total of 483 years. So he's giving us the whole period except for the very last week, which would make up to 490 years. Right here he's showing us the first 69 weeks and the last week is the 70th week. From the going forth of the commandment to restore 
and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince when he is anointed. Unto Messiah the Prince is seven weeks or 49 years. Why? Because that was the period it took to build, re, rebuild the temple. And then from the time of the rebuilding the, the temple, it commenced then the three score and two weeks or the 62 weeks of years, the 434 years. From that time then, from when the temple was built to the countdown of when Messiah the Prince would be anointed by John. From the going forth the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince is seven weeks or 49 years and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built and the wall in troublous times in the time of Ezra Nehemiah, right? In troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, after, this is really important that you catch this because people are really confused with this, of the timing of tribulation, how long is the great tribulation? This all makes it very, very plain if we can hear what it's saying. And after three score and two weeks, the seven weeks has already expired, the 49 years. After three score and two weeks, so seven weeks and three score and two weeks makes a total of 69 weeks, okay? It says after these three score and two weeks, which brings us up after 69 weeks. Now we are into the 70th week. What's after 69 weeks is the 70th week. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. What's it talking about? When he gave his life on the cross, he was cut off out of the land of the living. That happened in the 70th week. It's really important for you to understand that. The scripture is very exact here. After three score and two weeks, after the 69th week, Messiah the prince is cut off, but not for himself, for the sins of the people. This is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. I'll just back up a few verses. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. See, we're being led by another spirit. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. And he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? This is a thing to hear here. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. It's saying, where's his seed? Where are his children? He was cut off. But the question is, is, is soon to be answered. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, hath put himself to, he has put him to grief when he made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. There it is. There's the generation. There are his children. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his death days. What's it talking about? This is going to be in the 70th week, the second half of the 70th week. 
there are those, his seed, that prolong his days upon the earth because he was cut off in his ministry on the earth. Back to Daniel. After three score and two weeks, after 62 weeks of years, added to the 49 years, takes us to 483 years. After that period brings us into the last week, the final seven years of this prophecy. This prophecy of the beast system coming to its fullness, of the great tribulation, of the, the saints of the most holy, their power being scattered. And then that kingdom coming down. All that happens within this period, within this last week, it is fulfilled. But remember what it said. It said, after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So we're now into the 70th week. Which we're going to see here in a moment. And after three score and weeks, Three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. That he would make reconciliation for iniquity. That he would finish the transgression. That he would make an end of sins. That he would bring in everlasting righteousness. He was cut off, but not for himself. And it says, and the people of the prince shall come. I'm going to turn there for a moment. Daniel chapter 9, if you want to turn there. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, I believe. Daniel 9, 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, that shall come, shall destroy the city and sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. What's it talking about here? And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is all talking about the Lord. Messiah, the prince, the people, the prince that shall come, shall destroy the sanctuary. Oh, that must mean the beast. That must mean Antichrist. No. We know throughout Israel's history that if Israel fell into apostasy, if, if she was given to idols, she was given to this world, she was laying with the world, that God would bring correction and judgment through other nations. Through that superpower of the world. Whether it was Egypt, whether it was Babylon. So this people of the prince is the Romans. That brought destruction upon Israel. Because she rejected her Messiah. You see, when Jesus said, One jot and one tittle shall not, heaven and earth shall not pass away. One jot or one tittle shall not, in no wise pass from the law until heaven and earth pass away. Heaven and earth passing away was speaking of the temple where heaven and earth meet. One jot and one till passed from the law. He didn't say the law and the prophets. He said the law. Jesus fulfilled the law in his sacrifice. He fulfilled all those sacrifices. One, one thing had to be fulfilled yet in the law, though. You reject the law. You reject the one who fulfilled it all. 
then the judgment of that law comes upon you. From the time that Jesus went to the cross was 40 years until the Romans came and the Jewish wars of, of starting in the year 67 up until AD 70. And by AD 70, the temple was destroyed. God declaring, no, this religious system, you rejected Messiah. This judgment comes upon you. To plainly abrogate and declare that my temple is not made with hands. It is not in your religious system of your own works. It is in the finished work of my son. You rejected him. And now this judgment of the law, the Old Testament law, has come upon you because you've rejected the one who fulfilled it all. You couldn't even see the one that it pointed to. And that heaven and earth passed away where in the temple heaven and earth met Israel in the holiest of all. where God's throne extended from heaven to earth to them. One jot and one tittle shall not pass from law to all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot and one tittle shall not pass from law to all these things be fulfilled. So the law was fully abrogated in AD 70. The only thing that had to be fulfilled was the judgment. They were given 40 years. 40 years is the period of probation to turn, to repent, to come out of spiritual Egypt. Just as the book of Revelation calls Jerusalem, it's called spiritually, it's called Sodom and Egypt. Because she's in bondage with her children. She's still under the works of law. And she's not standing in the finished work of Christ. Sodom, she's given to this world. And Egypt, she's still in spiritual bondage. When you go out in the New Covenant and try to go back into the law and fulfill the law, which was a type and shadow of, (laughs) <laughs> you bring yourself back in bondage. Paul said that. He made it very clear. Why do you desire to be back in bondage? Being beguiled by the simplicity of Christ, by the serpent. Why, why, why do you have to fulfill the feast when Jesus fulfilled the feast? I don't have a problem if you want to do Feast of Tabernacles. I'll go hang out with you in the Sukkot. But don't think you're more spiritual or you're the elect because you're observing the types and shadows. When the real has come, when he's tabernacling in those who believe, who have prepared a place in their heart for him, we will dwell in them and walk in them and we will be their God and they shall be our people. Oh, but you need to celebrate the fall feast. Yom Kippur. He made atonement. Yom Teruah, the day of the shout. Blessed are the people that know the joyful shout. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of your face. That's because the illumination of the lamp stand within. They're walking in the light and glory. Those who have prepared a place in their heart. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, and in your name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense, the Holy One of Israel, our King. Oh, but you've got to keep the Sabbath. <laughs> Come unto me, all who are weary, heavy laden, I will give you rest my rest in my finished work. Walk with me, be led by Holy Spirit, not by an external law, but the inward 
dwelling of Holy Spirit. As it says in 1 John, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and him and them. He who keeps his commandments dwells in him and him and them. And hereby we do know that he dwells in in us by the Holy Spirit which he has given us. You see, the new covenant is a covenant of divine union. The old covenant could not do that. The old covenant cannot bring you into divine union. This is the Melchizedek priesthood. That's why it transitioned from the Levitical priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood. The Melchizedek priesthood brings in the better way, the perfect way of divine union. The old covenant cannot do that. Quit living in types and shadows that pointed to the one, the real, the true reality. The kingdom is in you. The new covenant establishes the kingdom, the throne within. The old covenant did not. It had an external law that governed carnal man, that governed a fallen man. The new covenant has better promises. (laughs) Divine union. The kingdom established within. Not without. Natural Israel was looking for a, a kingdom sta- established outside. When, the, when Jesus came, they were looking for him to restore that outward kingdom of Israel. But he was coming first to establish the kingdom within. And the new covenant, he does that through divine union. And when the covenant is established within, then we have the millennial reign. So what must happen in this last week is the kingdom must be established within. And that kingdom established within will bring down the kingdom of this world. Will bring down the beast kingdom. Because the beast kingdom is allowed to stand. Why? Because men's hearts are joined with him. He is enthroned within them. His spirit Back to Daniel 9.26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. After three score and two weeks. We're now into the 70th week. The last week. Shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. We saw this happen in AD 70. Where the Romans destroyed the temple. We see throughout the Old Testament nations that came in judgment of Israel. The Lord called them his servants. And the people, the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. This flood of this army is coming. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. The end of that war, it was made desolate. The temple was made desolate. Then we come to verse 27. And he shall confirm. Who's he? What's the whole context? Messiah the prince. Messiah. The people of the prince. It's all Messiah. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is the last week. This is Daniel's 70th week. But remember what it said there in verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. After the 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Which takes us into this last week. 
Verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant. Jesus <laughs> shall confirm this covenant, this covenant of divine union, this covenant to reestablish the throne within, the throne of glory. Thus saith the high and lofty one, Isaiah 57, 15. Thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says, He has set eternity in the heart of every man. Thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Those who will come out of the throne of their own heart and lift me up. My throne can be reestablished in them to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst or the middle of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. See, after the 69 weeks, he was cut off. He was cut off in the 70th week, in the middle of the week. He was anointed as Messiah and Prince at the beginning of his ministry of three and a half years. And at the end of that three and a half years, he was cut off in the middle of this 70th week. So all that remains in this 70th week is three and a half years. It's been held in abeyance all this time from the first century, waiting for a people who would prepare themselves, waiting for those who would enter into divine union with him, waiting for the bride who would prepare herself. The bride has made herself ready. so that the sun may shine upon her and she would birth the man-child to rule all nations with a rod of iron, to bring down the enemy's kingdom, to establish the kingdom in the hearts of his people. To bring the priesthood in alignment with the Melchizedek priesthood. Bringing forth the bread and the wine as Melchizedek brought forth to Abraham this covenant to enter into divine union. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in you. Divine union. If you abide in me, John chapter 15, 7, this is the covenant of divine union. If you abide in me, in my mercy, in my shed blood, you walk in that mercy. And my words, my rhema, my sayings abide in you through Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Holy Spirit will bring all these words to your remembrance. You are led by Holy Spirit in you. And my words, my sayings abide in you. You're abiding in me. I am in you. We're in divine union. If you abide in me and my words, my sayings abide in you through Holy Spirit, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Does it sound like you're ruling and reigning with him? Because most high has been lifted up. You've entered in divine union with him. Romans 5, 17, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign, shall reign in life through one, Christ Jesus. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1, a king shall reign in righteousness. That's him enthroned in us. A king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. That's us ruling and reigning with him within Our righteousness is because of the one in us. A king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. 
And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry land, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And the eyes that see shall not be dim, and the ears that hear shall hearken. Yes, that's during the Great Tribulation. This people that come forth, that are birthed, that birthed the man-child out of this intimate union of bride and the bridegroom. We call her the first fruit bride because there will be others that come in. These unwise virgins that didn't have the oil, they will be brought in. And after three score, so back here to Daniel 9, 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and the middle or midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease when he paid, when he paid it on the cross. After three and a half years, he was cut off in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Now what's left, the last half of the week, and he's waiting for those who joined to him in that covenant so that then he through them can fulfill that last three and a half years and bring down the kingdoms of this world and usher in the millennial reign. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. This is Psalm chapter 50. These people who have come out to the Lord, who have prepared a way, who have entered into this covenant of divine union with him, who will lay it all down. Who will not lay with this world. Who will not partake of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Who will not eat at the enemy's table but only at the Lord's table, eating of his blood, of his body, his mercy, his truth, and joining him there and laying down their life in first love. And living and attentive to his spirit. As Isaiah 16, 5 says, this is this covenant of divine union through the key of David. The key of David is mercy and truth. It is the finished work of Christ. It is this covenant where we enter into divine union. Isaiah 16, 5, in mercy, the throne is established. His throne within us, reestablishing that throne of glory within us. In mercy, the throne is established. That's not only his blood, it's us laying down our life to be joined to him there. Remember, that's, that's what's waiting at this middle of this week, a people that would join him in this covenant. Who will follow the lamb wherever he goes. That means they've laid their life down as the lamb as well. Isaiah 16, 5, in mercy the throne is established and he is the king of glory. He shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David. This tabernacle of David, those who have established this throne of the king of glory, this is the Melchizedek priesthood. The Melchizedek priesthood brings forth the bread and the wine. Come, enter back into divine union that the throne may be reestablished in you fully. In mercy, the throne is established, and he shall sit upon it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation or foundation of his throne. That's him prolonging his days for three and a half years during the great tribulation, to bring down the enemy's kingdom. How does he do that? 
he manifests himself through an overcoming company. To bring and manifest his person. Such bright truth and righteousness coming forth from this people. How do you bring down, how is the enemy's kingdom established? He became enthroned within a people. People believed a lie. They walked according to that lie. How do you bring it down? You've got to bring this truth forth. You've got to bring forth this righteousness of this kingdom. It's not just by let's kill them all and start over. No. Are there people going to be die? Yes. Just like Annas and Sapphira. Yes, people in the priesthood that won't turn, that won't let the people go, that won't let the people enter into the freedom that is in Christ, in the finished work of Christ, that want to be in control, that want to be, if some of those people won't repent, some of those people are going to die. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, the sacrifice and the oblation shall cease. He fulfilled it all. Now he's just waiting for the vessel that he may fulfill that last half of the week. And we see very plainly in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, now concerning the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him, those that have been prepared and are gathered together unto him, into one, into union. Now concerning the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto you, I beseech you that you be not soon shaken, nor troubled in mind, nor in spirit, nor by letter from us that the day of Christ is at hand. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. See, he's sitting in the Lord's throne, in the hearts of a people. Know ye not when I was with you, I told you these things? For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. What's the mystery of iniquity? It's juxtaposed the mystery of Christ, of Christ in you, the hope of glory, reestablishing his throne. The mystery of iniquity is, is us allowing, as we continue to lay with the world, for his throne to be in us, for us to be exalted and lifted up with him. For the mystery of iniquity has already worked in them who now let it, who let it work. Oh, it's okay, a little compromise. No, the priesthood isn't compromised. Jesus came to establish a new priesthood. A priesthood to bring a people into divine union. Back to 2 Thessalonians. For the mystery of iniquity does already work only in them who now letteth. Let's go there really quick. 2 Thessalonians. I'm just going to back up. I've covered all these things, but depending where you came in. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. With his mighty angels, that can also, angels can be translated messengers. In some translations translate it messengers of his power. Who are these? The Lord Jesus being revealed with the messengers of his power. It's what Enoch prophesied in Jude. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. 
It's the 144,000. It's this Melchizedek priesthood. It's the first fruits, those who have joined to him in covenant union. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, the messengers of the power. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've gone into detail on this, what this, the depth of this means. Taking vengeance, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter um, 10 verse 5 says, you know, we're to cast down every thought and imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. For we, the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strong down, strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to punish or to vindicate all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What's it saying? When you've overcome, now you have the authority to bring this vengeance on the enemy to deliver people. And this is what's happening here. He's now Christ is being revealed through this overcoming company, bringing vengeance on the enemy's kingdom to bring it down. To bring vengeance on the carnal mind. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not. Who are those that know not God? Those that walk after the carnal mind, that walk not after the spirit that are in deception. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who be, shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Oh yeah, we're going to kill them and throw them in hell. Or could it mean more? Could it mean they're punished with everlasting destruction from the presence, from the face of the Lord? Because that old man is put away. The lie is put away and they believe the life that you came in flaming fire taking vengeance on the enemy. Smiting the oppressor, Isaiah 11, with the rod of your mouth and with the breath of your lips. The ruach, the spirit of truth, slain the lawless one, the wicked one, the carnal mind, the mind of the beast. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified, where? In his saints. He's coming with ten thousands of his saints. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. This is the pure in heart that shall see God. They shall see him manifested in themselves and out of themselves. He that dwells in unapproachable light, dwelling in man. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. This was our originally call to glorify him. When man knew God, he glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of God into an image made like corruptible man. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our Lord, of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Now we beseech you, brethren, by this coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together unto him, Okay, I'm going to go with Psalm 50 real quick to tie this gathering together. Psalm 50, verse 1. Psalm of David. The mighty God, the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun until the going down the same. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. This is his bride. God has shined. 
Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him. Ah, sounds a little bit like that. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous around about him. That's his glory. He shall call to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Who is worthy that you may be counted worthy of this calling? He shall call to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints. It's the Hebrew word, the seed. Gather my merciful ones together. Those who have entered into this covenant of first love. Gather my merciful ones together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. This is what's waiting. This first half of the week has been in abeyance. Waiting for those who will prepare themselves to enter into union so that he can fulfill that half, week, that half week that he would prolong his days. After the beast system fully arises, then he comes in and begins to dismantle it. Beginning, establishing, reestablishing the priesthood. Establishing the kingdom within in a company of believers that have overcome Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind nor be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as by, from us, that the day of Christ is at hand, the day of the Lord. That's during this great tribulation. Let no man deceive you by any means. I don't care if anybody's vision, somebody gave you a word, the Lord's on his way. I had somebody message me six months ago. They were at Feast of Tabernacles, and somebody gave a prophetic word. She was the most prophetic of all of us. Well, that's great, but I'm going to believe the word. <laughs> she said, Jesus is on his way. Okay, well, maybe it's maybe we got two more years. Maybe he's on his way. He's like circling around, right? Let no man deceive you by any means. And she got upset with me because I gave her the scriptures and goes, I know the scriptures. It's eminent. He's like now. Well, that was six months ago. Let us not be deceived. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or this worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? What is happening we, these two kingdoms are big time going to clash. What do we have? We got the manifest sons being revealed. This man-child company of 144,000 in who Christ's throne is fully established. But then there's another company of believers who fell away, who entered into a deception, and the enemy's throne is being established in them. He is bringing forth his man-child. Led by a forerunner company that were created to be part of the 144,000, but they were deceived. They were led into the subtleness. They came out of the simplicity that is in Christ. And they were led away by this mysterious wisdom. You see, in Revelation chapter 7, where, where we see these 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, the tribe of Dan is missing. Why? Why is the tribe of Dan missing? But yet, in Ezekiel, we see the tribe of Dan. Why is the tribe of Dan missing in the 144,000? Because of what Lucifer said. You know, Dan, when... Was it Isaac that prophesied over his children? I think it was Isaac, right? Or Jacob? <laughs> I forget which one, right? He, when he prophesied over Dan, he says he is as a serpent in the way. 
He is as a serpent in the way. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 14 says. Isaiah 14, verse 12. O Lucifer, how art thou fallen from heaven? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou art cut down to the ground. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend above the the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Be careful. Is it talking about the celestial stars? Or could it be speaking about an elect? In Job chapter 38, verse 7, it says, when, when, when Yah was asking Job, where were you when? Verse 38, verse 7, when the stars of God sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. These are elect ones that were called from the foundation to fill the seat that Lucifer vacated. Isaiah chapter 14. Because you have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. You know, when we have the tribes of Israel around the tabernacle in the wilderness, you know where Dan was on the north? On the side of the north. There's three tribes on the north, and Dan was on the side of the north. What's going on? Just as one of the twelve betrayed the Lord. There is an elect in whom is deceived. He shall sit in the mount of congregation on the sides of the north. He will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. I will sit. I will manifest my sons. I will manifest my man-child. Company. Yes, I will have my head in the Antichrist in the earth. And I will have a man-child company as well, in whom my throne is established. You know that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. And then Matthew adds, let him who readeth, let him understand. What's he saying? This is a deeper import. It's a spiritual thing Jesus is saying. He's talking about a throne He's speaking about a desolation in the hearts of men. Let him who readeth understand. It's not just speaking of this physical temple and a man sitting in it. It's speaking of desolate in the heart. People that were led away and believed deception and believed a lie. And the enemy is fully establishing his throne when they think they're working for the Lord. Just as the religious people, when Christ came at his hour, they thought they were working for the Lord, but they were vipers. Even so it is now. The priesthood is in the same condition as it was when Christ came. It was a mess. Father, I thank you for your great purposes being fulfilled. That you foreordain from before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before you in love. Having predestinated us unto sonship through Jesus Christ unto, me, unto yourself. 
according to the good pleasure of your will, unto the praise of the glory of your grace, wherein you have made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through your blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of your grace, wherein you have abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of your will. Father, I thank you for quickening the hearts and minds of your people. that we may come into the fullness. Thank you that things are getting clearer and clearer. Thank you that the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. May we remember there is none good but you, God. Anything good that we do is because of you dwelling in us. I have so much more to release, but I think I'm going to leave it there. I thank you for sealing your word, Lord. I thank you for just connecting the dots, the revelation for people, and, and more revelation coming forth out of this that we being fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working of the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That we may all come to the unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Shalom. Shalom.